Something you said really stuck with me, and I want to just unpack it further. You said um, when, we, when we shared the platform, for those yeah. who don't know, for those who are listening, Omran is a barrister, a defense barrister. And for our American listeners, he is what you would call a defense attorney. But Omran, you said that sometimes when particularly young black men go to court and they wear a do-rag, it can be a problem for them. Yes. Why is that the case? Why are these people beefing the do-rag? What's wrong with them? <laughs> well, funny thing about the do-rag, I mean, I, I actually mistook the do-rag for something else, which, which shows how I personally un- uneducated I am. But yeah, indeed, right? But it's because the people who sit in judgment, you know, the, the funny thing about criminal courts in particular is that it's supposed to be judgment of your peers, but it's never that, right? It is never oh, really? the case that it is your peers judging you, right? It will never okay. be a, a jury of 12 young black males from disadvantaged backgrounds who will be sitting in judgment of a young black male from a disadvantaged background. It will be people mm-hmm. without criminal records because it's necessary in order for you to sit on a jury for you to be of good character. Yes. People without criminal records, people who can afford to be on jury service, who can take the time exactly. out. Exactly. What? Uh, exactly. And in the magistrate's court where the majority of criminal cases take place, it's usually old white men who, because as a magistrate, you volunteer. So you, you, you're not paid to sit as a magistrate. Okay. If you're a judge, yes, you're paid. But if, if you're a magistrate, you're not. You volunteer. And you can, obviously, you can only volunteer so much of your time if you've got something going on in the background that means you don't have to work full time. Yes. So again, it's but never... As a, as a magistrate, you're talking someone who judges on the cases. Yes. So, so a magistrate and a, a... The only difference between a magistrate and a judge in the magistrate's court is that the judge is legally trained, so he doesn't need someone who is legally trained to help them about the law. Whereas a magistrate yes. isn't, doesn't have the legal background, doesn't have the legal education, so they have what are called legal advisors. But the problem is they, they, see, you know, they read the news and they read the stereotypes about black people, about young black males. And when they see someone wearing the clothes that they've, they've read about their whole lives and these, these fittings for the stereotype that they've heard about their whole life, even if that person has a good case you know, is of good character, the way that they dress, the way that they act, if it fits the stereotype, then it will, they will come down more harshly on them just because wow. they fit that stereotype. Wow. That, that is very telling. Isn't that then a fundamental flaw within the system then? That is a yeah, powerful system. A, yeah, yeah, definitely. And actually you can, I've represented several, you know, black people in, in my career. And I, I remember this one case of this young black woman was horribly mm-hmm. treated by its City of London police. City of London police has a reputation for being quite racist. That's different she, to the Met, isn't it? Yes. So City of London police covers. Isn't, some, based, isn't City of London even like a even like a private corporation? Almost. Yeah. So it, it covers a very small part of London. It covers okay. sorts of it covers the city and a bit yeah. of sort of Holborn area, but it doesn't go anywhere beyond that. They are extremely well funded as far as police forces go, and they are very aggressive police officers. Wow. And I represented this young woman who was, she failed to stop for police. They had signaled, they were behind her, they checked her car, they thought she was driving without insurance, so they turned on the lights. She thought it was because they needed to speed by, so she didn't stop for them. She just stopped naturally at a red light. And this is a woman who's a victim of domestic violence. She's got all sorts of health issues. So she stops at the red light. This big police car then stops right next to her, and, and a couple of burly, big these are these are big guys. You know, they come out, come out of yeah. the car. One of them, credit where credit is due, is very calm with her, reasons with her, etc. But one of them, he's a small guy, very aggressive, very almost violent, right? And wow. she is she stopped. She's asked to turn the the car off. She does that. And she pleads with them. She says, I want to speak to a female officer. I don't feel comfortable. And they just ignore her. They're saying, just come out of the car. Ultimately, one officer goes around to the passenger side, breaks the window, and they drag her out of the car. They drag her out of the car. The yeah, it's, it's very, very aggressive. Very Failing violent. to stop. Just, yeah. I'm, I'm so confused. Like, there's no prior like weapon or, she, or no, anything like that. No. It's literally just failure to stop. Nothing at all. Yeah, failure to stop for police. This is, this is, this is it, a black woman, isn't it? 
yeah, she's a black woman in circumstances where the, because I, there was body worn footage in circumstances where there it's, you know two lanes the the opposing lane there's a bus coming and the bus flashes its yes. lights so it's very clear yes. to the bus that the car the police car seems like it wants to go by go somewhere else because it's got its blue lights mm -hmm. on right so it's not immediately obvious to even the bus that this police car is telling this woman to stop by turning on its lights. So it's a very understandable position that she is in. So they drag her out of the car. They then pin her to a wall. And this one extremely aggressive police officer, they do in the end, a female police officer comes to the scene. But I think that's just by chance. Because looking at the evidence, it did, there, no one had made an effort to actually contact a female police officer. It's just that one turns up. She manages to calm her down. And this one guy is just extremely aggressive, waving a, uh, I think it's a breathalyzer or a drug or a cannabis drug test in front of her, yeah. um, just wagging it in her face. And she, she's crying. She's very distraught, you can tell. And he just, he's badgering her, shouting at her. And she, in frustration and anger, just makes a face at him. And he says on the body when he said, don't you spit at me, don't you spit at me. She, hasn't, she didn't spit on anyone. He hasn't spat on anyone, visible on the body one. And when he says that, his two colleagues, who are quite tall, quite big, just pin her to the wall quite aggressively and then slam her to the floor. I'm absolutely, like, this and, actually made me so upset and so angry. Yeah, yeah. Well, it made her upset and angry as well. And actually... Of course, of course. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't even well, there. This is... This well, is yeah, awesome. it's no surprise. And actually, you know, in law, I mean, we have, you know, the solicitor and I had advised her that in law, she didn't have a defense, but... She was so angry about it all that she wanted these officers to be brought to court to answer for what they had done to her, yeah. which is fair enough, right? I mean, it's not the first time that I've had, you know, people in criminal cases tell me, look, I've been treated so unfairly by the police. And you have to tell them, well, look, if that's how you feel, it's the criminal process isn't the way for you to, to address that issue. Uh, but some mm -hmm. people want the police to be on the witness stand, to be cross-examined by by barristers, by solicitors, uh, to, to be asked tough questions. Yes. But the, the point of this story is that the judge in her case was a black woman. Mm -hmm. She saw all of this footage. Ultimately, the client, on my advice, changed her plea to a guilty one the, halfway through okay. the trial. But the judge gave her what's called a conditional discharge. And that's, it's, in terms of the sentences, it's about the second lowest you can get. This okay. is a woman who had previous convictions. And I'm convinced... That because it, it is because she understood that woman's suffering as a black woman, right? Wow. I'm, I'm convinced that if it was anyone else on that bench, the sentence she would have gotten would be very different. She would not have gotten... Because, I mean, there's, there's a thing called credit for guilty plea. So in the criminal process, if you plead guilty at the first time you're brought to court, then you get a reduction in your sentence. You get a lesser sentence. It's to, to incentivize people to plead guilty, avoid wasting time if, you know, they have no chance in hell. So to get a conditional discharge halfway through a trial, the only reason she would have done that is because she had extreme sympathy for what she had wow. seen on the body-worn footage. And that's why, you know, representation matters, because it's shared experiences, it's understanding that there are some actions by law enforcement that are born out of I mean, racial prejudice. Re representation matches is what we would think, isn't it? But then we have the Pretty Patels, don't we? Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> we, there, we, there, we are, there are people it in, there are there are people in that category, you know, for sure. I mean it can be of it can be of I guess it can be of some benefit, I guess. But this thing of like you have to be represent I mean you have to be judged by your peers is almost a fallacy then is that the case? doesn't really take place. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely the case that people of ethnic minority backgrounds are overrepresented on on the defendant side of of the criminal justice system and underrepresented in where the decisions are actually made. What do you put that down to like the people who sit in jury and people who sit in majority? I mean you mentioned before people have to have time they're from a maybe yeah. a specific kind of socioeconomic background. But do you feel it has that much of an impact? I mean you mentioned the case of the judge. Do you have any other cases? I mean you don't have to go into detail, but do you that like a trend you've noticed within the justice system? I mean with juries it's less stark because juries are picked out at random from the local area. So but again like I said there is a requirement that you don't commit that you have a clean record and and the reality yes. is that juries by and large do reflect the sort of social and economic differences in the country because you are 
less likely to have a criminal record if you come from an under-policed community. So the, the problem is that some communities are vastly over-policed, right? And that's, that is the reason why they get a criminal record. You're, you're far less likely, you know, you're equally likely to have a joint on you if you live in Chelsea or if you live in, in a council estate. <laughs> I think you're being very generous when you say Indeed. joint. It's like, it's like, well, yeah, it's exactly. like, Carla, it's like yeah. when Akala Akala <clears throat> speaks of, if you were to police Glastonbury Festival, the same way you pl- police the hood, you will yeah. find every type way of class A drug there. Way more drug. Well, <laughs> exactly, honest. right? But, but, the, but the point is you're less likely to have a criminal record if you live in Chelsea than if you live in a council estate. And that means mm-hmm. you're, you're more likely to sit on a jury because of that, because you live in Chelsea, than because you live in a council estate. So it's, it's in that way, it sort of reflects the existing differences, social economic differences within society. Well, that is a deeply flawed system then. How do we reform this system? I don't want to just speak on like kind of this idealistic term of, uh, or this idealistic thinking of what's the vision for the future. When you hear things like defund the police and then people even say abolish the police, we can speak about those things. What's your take on things like defunding the police? And again, for our listeners, I hate people, I don't hate is a very strong word. People have this thing of like this knee jerk reaction. What do you mean by defund the police? Wait, wait, take a, take a breather, guys. Take a breather, guys. All we're saying is the, the, the police roles or the roles that have been designated to police officers are many. Many of those roles do not have to be done by the police. And many of times we can take in funding away from the police can result in a, a, the reallocation of funding, whereas less where it's going to be early intervention yeah. programs and yeah. things like this. So yeah, just to guess what, sorry, well, to give that background I, for I, what do you think of the fund the police? I, I agree with that. And actually, I mean, it's, if, if you listen actually to some, and this might be controversial to your listeners, but there are some police voices who they don't agree with the, with those particular terms, defund the police, but they agree with mm-hmm. the sentiment, right? They, they also okay. agree that actually we criminalize way too many things. There are better ways of dealing with, with certain things. Mm-hmm. For example, drug possession and drug yeah. addiction, um, exactly. because actually consuming most of these drugs isn't a criminal offense. It's possessing them. Um, yeah, and true. the Met Police in particular, I mean, the Met Police is the one that will, because it's the largest police force in the UK, the next, the, yeah. the, the second largest is Greater Manchester Police. But the Met, the voices in the Met Police, the reason they don't want to decriminalize cannabis is because it allows them to conduct stop and searches. It's the ground, it's the... corrupt. <laughs> it is, it is in a way. Because the way they view drug policing is a gateway, it's their gateway drug actually, into policing violence and policing serious violence. That's how mm-hmm. they see it. And they say that if you take away our ability to stop people because we think they have drugs, then it'll be harder for us to stop people and arrest people for violent offenses. Which is bullshit because, sorry, it's rubbish because... They, <laughs> no, 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 I love it. Be, be open, don't worry. This is, this is open, be as open as you want. <laughs> Thank you. Because they already have powers to stop and search people that they, if people if they think that those people are carrying weapons. Or exactly. if they think people uh, are carrying stolen goods. They have those powers. But it's, it's obviously a lot easier to suspect people of carrying drugs because they just say, you smell of cannabis. Mm. And it's, How it's, many times have you heard that? Well, every time it's it's in every police every time they stop a car it's because it smells of cannabis even if oh, the wow. windows are rolled down the car they're in their car the the car is two cars ahead of them they happen to drive past it and magically they can smell cannabis i mean it's always <laughs> rubbish everyone knows it's rubbish i think even the officers know it's rubbish but the reason why they say smell of cannabis is because you can't bring a smell to court you can't prove a smell it's there it then goes away you can't also disprove a smell so it's impossible yeah. to fight the i smelled cannabis ground of of stopping them but i i mean i i fully agree with the notion that the police should be given far fewer roles and i i mean i think to in some fairness to them the reason at least in the uk why they have an oversized role is also because there has been defunding of other public services. And so Mm -hmm. other public services are swamped, don't know how to deal with certain things. You think like mental health, for example, the police answer mental health calls. They shouldn't be doing that. They're not trained to do that. And people who have, we're going through mental health episodes, 
can sometimes be violent or aggressive or uh, abusive. And the problem is the police view that from a criminal justice lens rather than mm. a mental health or a health perspective. So that, that's a very clear example. The, the other example, I think, is youth justice, especially yes. the Met. The, the, there, is, there is in law, there are very clear distinctions between people who commit, who are involved in criminal offenses before they are 18 and after they are 18. There are very strict rules that favor rehabilitation, that move them away from prosecution when they are under 18. But I've found that actually, and it's not just a, a police problem, it's a prosecutor problem as well, that okay. in reality, in practice, that difference isn't made. Okay. People who are under 18 are treated for all purposes as if they were over 18 and criminalized. And it's not viewed as, because have, you know when you get a criminal record, it's a serious thing that follows you your whole life. It can, it can change yeah. lives depending on what you've done, what you're sentenced to. And it's just not viewed in that way by the police or by, by the prosecution. So it really seems like it's like a system almost set to fail, isn't it? Because I've always said that if you look at people like Akala, who does amazing work, and I mentioned on this podcast before, in previous mm. episodes, they spoke about early intervention. They spoke about how there's a link between getting excluded from school and then going yeah. to, you know, to, to school to prison pipeline, all these things. But it's yeah. almost like the government system does not even care to listen to this thing, it's far easier to put people in prison. When it's, yeah. uh, it's quite strange because it costs far more to send people to prison a year than send them to even like a low level private school. Again, yeah. like that's the approach that they take. It's, it's an, it's, so is there any hope for this system? Can it even be reformed? What do you think? I think it can. I think it depends on who's in power. I don't think there is a hope in hell based on who is currently in power because the, you know Boris Johnson, Priti Patel and and they're ill. And... <laughs> they're pr practically racist anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, what they, they, all they do is come up with these ridiculous notions for criminal justice that aren't going to improve the situation. I mean, the thing is, Boris Johnson himself said, he said that when I see a group of black boys, I feel uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. If that's at the helm, or if that's, at, if yes, that's exactly. at the steering the ship, what do you think, you know? Oh, how, yeah, what do, what how do you expect, reflect? you know? Exactly, what do you expect? But I do want to ask you a personal question. Why did you go into defense? Mostly personal experience. So I'm, I mean, as you can tell, I don't have a British accent. I, I wasn't. I, wasn't I was going to ask you, yeah, where's was, your accent I from? Was, so, and, and, and have you taken elocution lessons? No, I haven't. I haven't taken elocution <laughs> lessons. But, so my, my mother is Algerian. My dad's Pakistani. I was born in France and I was raised in okay. France. And I went to an international school there. But for a long time, I lived in what was basically the equivalent of council estates in, in France. Okay. And I, I can't remember who I was saying this to, but actually the, the Algerian community in particular in France, the Algerian and Moroccans and the black community in France, they are policed to the same level as black people in the UK. So, okay. of course, our skin colors are different, but our experiences with the police, I mean, I've had run-ins with the police when I when oh, I was wow. living in France and it's those sort of run-ins that gave me the drive to become a, a criminal defense lawyer. I know Hawa has her own views about changing the system from the inside I and I admire those views but I've comment on that position. I've always felt that and you know it is it is a credit to her the, the task that she is undertaking and she's undertaking it with, with open eyes, I think. But I have always yeah. taken the view that it is extremely difficult to move that beast from the inside. Okay. And that actually these systems in Western countries are, you know, they, they give power to people like defense lawyers. There is a certain amount okay. that, that you can do with minimal resources. There is the possibility of putting a break on the system and the, the sort of grind of the system. And, and that's why I have the role or, or I, I take the role that I do. Mm -hmm. And it, I agree with the idea that there does need to be people within the system changing the system within the inside. It's just not something I want to do. Um, I okay. think it's, it's admirable that Howard is doing it. It's just, it's just not my cup of tea, as it were. No, um, that's, I think that's very fair. That's very yeah. fair. Many of my... Well, I hope many of my listeners will not, but I'm going to ask the same question I asked to how I'm going to ask you. If I ever get in trouble with the law, me as a young black man, where do I want to be tried? What offense have you committed? Ooh, let's play the <laughs> offense game. This is fun. This is fun. <laughs> Possession of marijuana. Where do I want to be tried? Oh, I mean, 
I just accept a caution for possession of marijuana. You, if you've never done anything else, you'll just get a caution. You okay. Want, you, want, you want something a bit more meaty. Okay, hypothetically, totally hypothetically, yeah. Yeah. totally hypothetically, getting into a fight where you knock out a racist on the street. Okay. And your defense is you're acting in self-defense. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah. Where do you want to be tried? My, my defense is self-defense here. Even, yeah, yeah. Even if I, even he started it. He started, he, he, it he's throwing a punch and you ducked and then you hit him back and he fell on the floor. Okay. okay, um, okay. So, so in, in that situation, I mean, you definitely want to be tried in front of a jury. That's for sure. Where you would want it to happen. And Snaresbrook is pretty good. So you'd want it to happen in East London. East London, okay. Snare, Snaresbrook is notorious for acquitting defendants. And, and again, that goes back to reflecting the sort of culture, the, the, the socioeconomic and cultural makeup of the local area, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think, I think you're ready, yeah? Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, <laughs> pause, I'm just turning it off. Um, it's all right. I love, I love, I love to keep it natural as possible. It happens, man. People eat food. People are. It's it's nine yeah. twenty five as we're recording this right now, so it's dinner time, guys. Yeah. But Snarebrooks carry on. Snarebrooks, you know, it's East London. It's at the moment and a few years before. It's not yet fully gentrified and full of sort of avocado toast. Yeah, I, mean, I grew, I grew up in Leytonstone. Well, exactly. It's it's yeah, it's so a very ethnically nearby. and culturally diverse area, and it reflects on the juries. I mean, I just finished trial, right? The trial is, is supposed to be in St. Albans, but it moved to Huntingdon, which is just before Peterborough. And there is one person of color on that jury. And was the defendant a person of color? Yeah. Two defendants. Okay. My client was uh, Lebanese. The okay. co-defendant was Somali. And we were both found guilty. Okay. I was found guilty of the more serious offense. And, and my co-defendant was found guilty of the lesser offense. But we were both found guilty. Okay, if I overturn a statue, so damage public, pro that's damage to public property, isn't it? Yeah. Or what do I want Cr to be criminal, tried? Or, criminal or, or, damage. Or, yes. But not tried, or what, or what do I want to do in that situation? I feel bad. I feel like I need to pay you after this, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't. It's, it's hypothetical advice. It's not real advice. Exactly. So oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you would, is this in the course of a protest? Is this like yes. a, it's, it's an act of protest that you've overturned? Yes, the statue, yes. Right? It's the statue of a racist. It's like Winston Winston yes. Churchill. it's Colston's cousin or something. Oh, Colston's right. brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, again, you'd you would want to be tried in front of a jury because you would want to make these points about racism, etc. That just will okay. fall on deaf ears on either a bench of magistrates or a district judge. So you'll want to be tried in front of a jury. Okay. Cool. Um, so, so basically, first. Is that, the, is that the bottom line? Person of color, you want to be tried in front of a jury. You like have a better line? shot. Yeah, you always have a better shot as a person of color. It, it's just, just statistics, right? It's people of yeah. color, the rates for acquittal of people of color is greater with juries than it is in the in magistrate's court. Okay. So that's the stats. That's the kind of breakdown. Yeah. yeah. Um, breakdown yeah. behind it. I know you want to get to your food, so I'm going to kind of ask you just one in last question that's possible. Sure. What's like the most... I don't know if it's the right word of like an interesting case that like if you can share or something that's something that was very memorable. I don't, I don't want to sound very giddy in the background. It might, it might be, it might be a terrible case, but I mean, Oh no, you know what? Even before we get there, I've got two questions. People yeah, always yeah. ask this. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if do you, do your criminal defense, do you have issues with morality, like defending like murderers and rapists? And people no, and I had, like so the, the one, the one issue of morality I did have was someone defending someone who it was an issue of morality i stress not an issue of ethics because ethically there was nothing wrong but i represented okay. someone who called this young woman a packy oh okay <laughs> which is obviously i mean it's it's odd right <laughs> but, <laughs> Absolutely. well yes exactly <laughs> but it's yeah i mean morally it wasn't i didn't you know i didn't feel great about it because i had to do my job and i had to cross-examine this this young woman about the fact that you know I had to cross examine her on the basis that when she was saying she's going to pull your scarf, she's not actually attacking your religion. She's just saying that she's pulling the piece of clothing that you're wearing. Oh it's obvious God. nonsense, but oh I had you, I have a job to do. Yeah. <laughs> How I, do you I do have, it? I have a job. How do you sleep at night? I have, I have a job. To, <laughs> well, I think you know there's a difference between ethics and moral. There was no difficulty at all ethically in me doing it. It is. It is the role I play in the system, right? But you yeah. know, obviously, it does it does gnaw at you morally. But I have to put that aside because ethically, that case came to me. I have a duty to to do my best for that that client. They're you know they're being charged with a criminal offense, and I have 
to represent them. But obviously, you know, it, we are human as yeah. as lawyers. Uh, everyone is human. It's it's ridiculous to suggest that it doesn't have it doesn't affect me at all. Of course, it does. It's just that you have to park it right. Um, yeah. while you are working for that client, you have a professional responsibility for them and you have to fulfill it. But of course, these things do have an effect morally. Mm-hmm. Okay. But have you ever like had like a major case like that, like like a murder trial or... No, I'm too like... junior for that. No, inshallah, that will oh, come. Oh, okay, okay. That will come later uh, on. But... I, I, don't know, I don't know if you say inshallah. I don't know if you say inshallah to those kind of things. But... Well, I say inshallah, <laughs> the trial will come. But, you know, okay, okay, okay. I, okay. I, don't, <laughs> I don't want anyone to be killed, obviously. But... <laughs> of course. <laughs> and finally, just share like a, a, a memorable case, if you don't mind. I think uh, it's memorable. I mean, what's the one case... I, I don't know if I shared this on the panel, but I had this young black man who was charged with assault occasioning actual bodily harm he's mm-hmm. someone who has serious mental health problems and he um he came up to someone in the middle of the road and they just hit them in the nose and he was arrested by the police almost you know within i think it was 10 minutes or something like that but oh, there was wow. body worn body worn footage again of him being very seriously manhandled by police officers he was handcuffed with his hands to his back he was pinned against a wall by two officers they then, for some reason, he, he, you can hear him say on the body worn, just let me sit down, let me sit down. And yeah. for some reason, they just tackle him to the floor. And you can see the, the body worn is kind of shaky, but you can see and hear one of the officers knee him in the back twice for no wow. reason whatsoever, for absolutely no reason. And, and he was, again, one of the, those kinds who was, you know, who wanted a trial because he was pissed off at the police. Understandable. Yeah. Again, not not the right. If if you have an issue with the police, you know they've manhandled you, they've wrongfully arrested you. They can be held liable in courts different than the the criminal courts. You have a civil claim. But how common is that, though? It's not common, and the reason it's not common is because of costs. Because it's it's risky to take oh. on to take on. It's financially risky to take on a claim. Okay. against the police because if you lose you then have to pay their costs of defending the claim yeah a lot of people oh, wow. are they're just not wealthy enough to take on the risk mm. and some cases the, especially the borderline cases where you know a court could go either way and it's sort of difficult to predict then it'd be really difficult to get funding and to protect yourself from the of police course. ruining you financially but but this just to get back to this case what's yes. striking is I played that body-worn footage in court because my point was he was very calm when faced with this assault by the police. So how yes. would how could he have committed this um, offense? Didn't work. Yeah. But but the point was I played this footage and I didn't even have to ask many questions of the officer because the judge laid into the officer for about fifteen minutes of how oh, how dare wow. you treat. And that that was really refreshing. This was a, a she's a young female. She's a white judge, young female okay. judge. And she, it was really refreshing because she's, and she's part of a sort of new generation who are sort of changing the tide, who is extremely fair, who doesn't display the usual biases that you would see in other tribunals. Yes. And it was just extremely refreshing because I, I barely asked any question of the officer because the judge just went straight into it. Really? And, and gave, him really into it. Re, yeah, gave him a really, really hard time. Wow. And she, she actually made a finding. She didn't have to. But she made a finding that they used unlawful force against him. It was completely unrelated oh, wow. to the case that she was trying. But she said in her, when she gave her conclusion, she found him guilty in the end. But it's a separate yeah. matter. But she said, I find that the police have used unlawful force against, against this person. And that was just, it was, it was just refreshing because that, that in part, you know, is a, in a way is what he, what he wanted, right? It's for, for yeah. someone to recognize that actually they've, they've seriously abused him. So okay, so there is kind of hope then. New, new generation. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not all doom and gloom. There is there is not all doom and gloom. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I've loved talking to you, man. Likewise. You are a force for good, man. And and keep up, man. Thank you. All right, take care. Until next time. Thank you very much, guys. You're listening to the Malcolm Effect. As always, please like, comment, subscribe. Be that whether that's on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube. Peace out.